Good afternoon. And now comes the rain. Yes. Hello. Okay, hello. Hi, how are you? I saw you before. Okay. All right. So, um, the format is going to be this. I thought I'd start down here and tell you a little bit about uh, the whole philosophy of the park. And then we'll walk down Main Street and then discuss the sequencing of the lands. And are we then going to go into one the same way we did the last time? Or yeah, we can maybe choose uh, which yeah. land that we would like. To. I'll try to sell you all four of those lands. And then I'm going to give you the chance to pick the one that you'd like me to take us further in. And we'll, we'll finish there. In that point. So now I get to complete compete with an orchestra here. Um, all of Main Street was, you know, originally depicting Walt Disney's childhood in the Midwest of the United States, and that was great for his age of, you know, and generation who could come back as adults and revisit their early youth. Well, here we are, we're a hundred and you know, 10, 15 years from Walt Disney's childhood, so. This has to have a different meaning. And so we felt it was still valid because it's a very peaceful and kind of quiet introduction to what's going to be a lot of entertainment that happens once we pass through this portal. So it's it's sort of a conditioning experience, leaving the real world and coming back to peace and quiet and then entering a world of fantasy. And so I think it sort of sets you up for something that you don't see in your normal everyday life. Now, a lot of things are different here than what we did in California and Florida and, and around the world, beginning with the hotel out in the front. Um, when we looked around Europe, especially here in Paris, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, what would I say, care given to the sense of arrival. So if you go to the Louvre, you've got the Tuileries in front. You go to Versailles, there are the gardens. Down, in, uh, down by Chinoso and Chambord, it's a beautiful sense of parking your car and going through something wonderful. And so we thought, especially being next to Paris, we needed something here that was a gift, something that was wonderful and invigorating before you came in. And we thought, what would be a symbol that would be inviting and warm and it seemed like an inn. Now when you look around, you see the, uh, the city hall and various public buildings here that are, what would I say, emulating a real city hall, but they're not really a city hall. And the, the hotel, we thought, well, it'll just be emulating a hotel. It'll just be a nice artificial inn. And when we showed it to management, we, they, we thought, oh, they'll love it. They'll give us extra money for this. And he said, no, uh, we love the idea, but where are you going to get the money? And I said, well, I thought maybe you'd like it and we'd get to build this extra thing. And, and Michael says, well, what if we made it a real hotel? And it just about, we all were just flabbergasted because the idea of building a hotel that actually participates in the park, that had never happened before. And so one thing led to another, and we were given the opportunity. We changed out, we didn't build one of the hotels down in the Disney, uh, past the Disney Village. Um, and so that money came into play and we created the Disneyland Hotel. And I'm very proud of it. It's the only hotel that was designed pretty much entirely by Eddie Sato at Imagineering, and I helped him with the fighting to get it done uh, and make sure that it, it happened. And it's, I think, our favorite, everybody's favorite of all the hotels. And the idea of being close to Disneyland, that's what all of you people like, you know. So it's turned out that, you know, a lot of folks said, oh, people want to get away at night and be away from the park. That's not true. Uh, we hear again and again how excited people are to be a part of the the closeness of the, uh, the Disneyland Park. So that, I think, was the major change down here. Now the gazebo, Walt Disney wanted a gazebo exactly there at Disneyland. And they had to take it out because the flagpole went there. When we came to France, we thought it might be okay to have an American flag over in the corner. But it would not be right to put an American flag right smack dab in the center of the park. So we all thought about it. We said, what if we bring back Walt Disney's idea and build the gazebo here. So this is this is the only Disneyland park that has what Walt Disney originally conceived for the center of town square. If you go to Orange County in, uh, Amer in California, you will find the original gazebo. It was sold to a garden uh, supply place down in Newport Beach, Ro Rogers Gardens, and 
the gazebo still exists and they're cherishing it because it's a such an artifact from Disneyland. But to find one in a Disney park in the town square, only in Disneyland parks. So let's uh, talk a little bit and then we'll start walking and we can walk and talk. Uh, Main Street is a lot of recognition to the, the Main Street that was done in Walt Disney World. But we were told that they wanted a coverage over it because of the weather here. Uh, and today we're getting a little sample of that. <laughs> Yesterday it was hotter than California. <laughs> today we got a little bit of uh, sprinkle. But we knew that the Europeans, especially the French and the visitors that come to France, love the idea of being out in the cafes. If you walk through Paris, everybody's out on the streets dining in the cafes. It's an amazing culture and atmosphere. And the last thing anyone wants to do is go back into a dark, you know, space. So covering Main Street, it would have lost the vitality. And we have done that in Tokyo, where shopping is very, very important. But when you choose to do it, you can't have parades, you can't have horses, and you can't have, you know, automobiles with gas. You know, none of those things can work indoors. So I really think we made the right decision to go this way. But we still had the requirement of getting people through here when it's snowing or when our parades are very uh, crowded on Main Street. So to the back of both sides of Main Street is an arcade. And these arcades are extremely beautiful, but they cost far less than covering Main Street. So we had extra money after we finished that and we were able to take the interiors of every shop and plus them, we call it plusing, where they are far more beautiful and far more detailed than anywhere else. And people were asking us, why are you doing that? You know, we've never done that before. And the answer is simple. When you're in Orlando for, you know, Disney World, nobody goes to Orlando. Nobody sees what the stores are like in Orlando. And they're not very different from anywhere else in the world. The same is true of Anaheim. But here in Paris, shopping and the culture and the history and the beautiful architecture and the interiors and everything is exquisite. And we know our guests are going to be familiar with that and they're going to go to those places because unlike Orlando and, and uh, Anaheim, how many of you have ever been to the cities of Anaheim or Orlando? I live in Orlando. You have been I, downtown. I live there. Oh, oh, you do? Yes, okay. I live over there. All right. Well, then you know, what, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our guests go right to Disney and then right back to the airport. Yes. Here in Paris, we know our guests are going to the city. So what you see inside these buildings, I'm very proud. I think Eddie Sato did a job on Main Street that looks just as elegant, just as rich as anything you find uh, in a Parisian boutique uh, to this day. So, all right, so we're gonna, I think we'll walk down the street. And uh, if anyone has something they'd like to ask about, just butt in. I, you know, I, I'd love to talk, so I'll be glad to. Well, I, off on I have a sentimental question. Yes. The Flores Boutique, although I love it a lot. Okay, I know where you're going. <laughs> that little, the little uh, stand in there for the photographer's studio and everything, I miss that too. But I worked heavily with Kodak when we did Journey into Imagination for Epcot. They were one of the biggest companies in America, and all of a sudden, the little things you're holding in your hand. How many are using film today inside that? Is there film in there? No. <laughs> no. So all of a sudden we had a shop that it didn't work anymore. There was nothing that could be sold there. Uh, even the SD cards, they have such capacity now. I, I remember having to buy four or five SD cards when they were eight gigabytes, you know, to come on a trip like this. Now you get one that's 128 or 200 and you know, whatever, 56, and it lasts for like three trips. So there's there's no uh, reason to have that store. So unfortunately, you know, Disneyland is not a museum. That's the thing I've had to, we grow up with things that we love, and if it was a museum, they might stay there forever, but it's a living, breathing thing that has got to be relevant to new children. And this is a good example. I remember putting in Jasmine's Palace to a, a ride we have in California, Storybook Land. We have one here too. So we took out one of the older scenes and we put in Jasmine's Palace from Aladdin. And all of the old timers like, oh my gosh, you know, you're, you're disrupting Walt Disney's. 
But I wrote it one day and there was a little girl in the boat and she was sitting there and she goes, Mommy, look, it's Jasmine's house. And I realized, unfortunately, we have that problem of making it still very appealing and comfortable for the generations that grew up with it. But the younger kids have to find their childhood in the park too. So, you know, that's what we deal with. All right, so let's, let's head out. out. To build Disneyland with the windows, and they've been adding to these windows since 1955. And I am very lucky. My favorite reward that I've ever gotten is not the Disney Legend Award, but I have a window on Disney's Main Street in Disneyland, and that's absolutely, I think, the finest thing for me. Uh, it's not that I don't like any of the other things, but when I looked at those names when I was young, and I saw, you know, Mark Davis and Claude Coates and and all the people that have uh, guided my career up there, the thought of ever being there, part of this was amazing. Now, Michael and Frank were the closest I ever came to working with a Walt Disney. These two guys, you know, Michael being the Walt and Frank being the Roy, uh, guided this company into doing some of the greatest things that have happened for the Walt Disney Company, from Little Mermaid on up through Lion King and film, and then you look at the parks, we added Animal Kingdom and Disneyland Paris during that great period. And the most unfortunate day of my career was when I was, a phone call came that Frank Wells had been killed in an accident. And uh, it did change the company. The Disney company is great when everything's working from terrific, like it was with Walt Disney and with, with uh, Michael and Frank. And now I think we've got great uh, leadership with, with Bob Iger. So we've kind of, you know, it, it, it varies that way. So I think this is something that we have to look to. And, and when I look up there, I think of those days when we built this and those guys that were really guiding us on and, and how terrific it was. I'm lucky to have one here, but all of these names were people involved in the building of the park. At one time, we were going to make Main Street a little bit more modern like into the 1920s because we found that in Europe, America was beginning to be interesting only after the development of technology. The jazz age had happened where there was a new type of music. There was the automobile and cities like Detroit and Chicago that came into being after the invention of cars. So it wasn't like here where everything is built around lake uh, or a river traffic pretty much and uh, the distribution was via horse cars and whatnot so your cities have a different feel it's more romantic in the states everything is, is big and uh, post automobile so there was an interest in that there was even an interest in the gangsters you know so we put together what if we moved it forward to uh, 1920 then Michael had a bad dream one night. He says, we can't destroy Walt Disney's dream. We have to take it back and make it look like all the other Disneylands. But we knew in Paris, Victorian architecture is something you created. So to make it a little more distinctively America, we put up a lot of these billboards and advertisements that give it kind of that brash, kind of young country look of America. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Walt's Restaurant, uh, has, has everyone here had a chance to dine in there? It's probably the finest restaurant in the park. Uh, I managed to get in there the other day, always like hard to get a ticket, but what's interesting about the rooms, each room up there is based on the art that was used to create the different lands of Disneyland. So you can dine in the Adventureland room, the Frontierland room, the Fantasyland, and, and so forth. And you're surrounded not by, not like if you went into the land and we're trying to en envelop you in an experience, but you're surrounded by the art that guided the designers and got management excited about what we were going to do. So those are the very concept pieces that, that literally guided this park. So it's, it's a really unique experience and beautiful. The food is delicious and very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question about the restaurant. Yeah. Did you get your inspiration from the 
I think they plant a piece of the, the, the flower cell in it. It covers my game, but uh, <laughs> I keep telling you guys, I push those flower cells. Uh, so you can probably see it from Walt. <laughs> yeah, from Walt you can see it. And uh, Marty Scalar, above me there, it was my uh, the lead of Imagineering for all the years that I worked there. So it was kind of nice to be <laughs> partnered with uh, Marty on um, the project there. So all of these mythical things like the Main Street Gazette, they're designed to give you the sense that there's a vitality, that people live here at Disneyland. And every, I, I even do a program called Who Lives at Disneyland, where I try to create the type of people in a little short film so that our cast members know what it is they're trying to do when they go to work in the different uh, areas here. Now the funny thing is cast members like the idea of the Main Street Gazette, and they've actually created the Main Street Gazette. So on their own, it's not part of uh, Disney or anything, they publish their own little paper about the, the goings on and what different employees are doing. And it's a beautifully done you know, piece of uh, antique looking paper. Right? So we're coming up to the hub, and this is as old as Greece. The idea of a spoke and wheel uh, organizational system. I know we've tried to come up with other ways of doing this in Epcot and other parks, but actually in terms of making it simple for the guests to understand. And of course you've all, since you're fans, you've gone to other companies' parks and whatnot. And I honestly don't think there's a better way to orient the guests as to where they are. Because you come into here and it's sort of neutral, and you have all these different choices of Adventureland and Frontierland, Discoveryland, Fantasyland, all beckoning with adventures that are very distinctly different. And the other thing I feel about Disneyland in general that Walt while, while Disney began, and we haven't changed much, is those words, Adventureland and Frontierland and Fantasyland, they're very clear on what kind of things you would expect in there as a guest, and they're very clear to the designers what it is we need to design that goes in there so that you find a land that is uh, a reflection of what the word says. It's harder to do when you've got, I remember like we had Condor Flats in California Adventure. That was a hard one to figure out. Well, what would I design for Condor Flats? You know, that, that doesn't tell me anything. But when I say, let's go to Fantasyland, you know it's going to be all about fairy tales and we're going to be run over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so once you get down here to this hub with the spokes, like a wheel, uh, people stand and they look and they're beckoned by these various icons that suggest the type of stories that would be beyond. And it's pretty obvious that a castle, especially a fairy tale castle, is going to be the gateway to all of the classic, you know, Walt stole them from Europe. They're all the beautiful classic fairy tales that the brothers Grimm and Perrault Various, you know, uh, Henry Dobson, you know, was uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, England. So, you know, these stories inspired Walt to do these incredible animated films. And so, for the first time ever, bringing those back here to uh, Europe was uh, a, a, not really a challenge. It was really fun to be able to bring those stories back here to where they began. So, the castle is far more, I think, Fairy tale like than the ones in California and in Florida. California is derivative from Neuschwanstein, King Ludwig's castle in Bavaria, and the one uh, in Florida is made up of a lot of different pieces from the great castles that are down along the Loire Valley, like Chenoso and Chambord and, and so forth. So when we did this, we said there's no way we can take the pieces of the French castle 
and put them together and, and then put it out in more in the ballet. So we went back to artwork and we had a lot of inspiration from Disney because of Sleeping Beauty and the Belle of Dormont that this is based on. Uh, we also had books and tapestries here that inspired all of us. If you have a chance, if you haven't done it, go to the Clooney Museum where the eight tapestries of the unicorn, I think there's eight, maybe seven, but you'll stand in an octagonal room with all these beautiful tapestries and it looks so much like the uh, landscape that we have around our castle. And the Duke de Berry wrote uh, the Book of the Hours in the medieval period and some of those little paintings have that distorted perspective that was typical of that era that kind of guided us in how we were going to deliver this. Now the most important thing to me in that castle is the, the, beneath the castle in the rockwork dwells a fire-breathing dragon. So uh, that's something that I had loved since I was a child. And when I saw the movie Sleeping Beauty, I was 12. Uh, I just, you know, fell in love with that. When I was in college, I did a concept for an attraction with a fire-breathing dragon at the end of it. And I've been showing that picture a couple times here to groups, uh, presentations. And it looks very close when I was 19 years old to what we were able to do in the castle. So Fantasyland was sort of a pleasure because all of the stories in there belong here and there are things that we were able to take into the bits of architecture there and reflect Italy, reflect Germany, reflect England, and reflect France, but in a, we're bringing it back in a very uh, abstracted and kind of fantastic kind of way. Um, let's say Discoveryland while we're looking at it. Uh, it was a challenge. Part of the thing we wanted to do when we uh, moved from the States over here was to develop an area, a whole land that was celebrating French culture, European culture. And how do you do that? You know, we build a, a village of French architecture. No, we decided that everybody in the world has done amazing things because they really were influenced and inspired by the dreams that were written about by great minds like Jules Verne and H.G. Uh, Wells and Leonardo da Vinci. Um, you know, generation after generation for hundreds of years have gotten you know, inspiration for this. When Jules Verne said that the first launch to the moon will take place in Florida, in the middle of the state, now how did he know that? I don't think he knew that. I think there was some little kid that read that story and said, well, why don't we launch from Florida? <laughs> you know, because Jules Verne said that's where we should do it, so let's do it. I think you can't underestimate how inspired we are by the dreams we read about when we're like 12, 13, 14 years old. Those things live with you for the rest of your life, or at least they should. So we came up with the idea, let's make Discovery Land a place where the dreams are celebrated and the dreams fuel the future. So people ask me all the time, well, why does you know, George Lucas fit in with Jules Verne and H.G. Wells? Well, you just answered it yourself. If you were living 150 years ago, Jules Verne would be your uh, George Lucas. If you're living 100 years ago, it would probably be H.G. Uh, Wells. And today, we are lucky to have someone that caliber in George Lucas. All of our lives have been changed by people like this. So the idea is to keep evolving Discovery Land to include and, and celebrate all the great dreamers that cause all of us in the current generation to dream things and create a better world. So that's sort of what went on there. And um, I think it's wise because in the world we live in today, architecture and things like every one of you is holding a cell phone. I've got a 4K. How many of you have a 4K screen? <laughs> so, um, and you know that you bought. You have to buy new things every year. If we were to build a place of this in that style, by the time we finished building it, you'd look at it and say, "Oh, I can see this is over." Whereas when you create something that's about dreams, I think it's sort of a move to that. It becomes something that always looks good when you come here. I'm always blown away when I, especially at night, when I see Space Mountain lit up. It's spectacular. Okay, Adventureland, which is hidden behind this. <coughs> so you can hear me better. But we had a lot of fun with that. We created an entry that's far more exotic than anything we've done before. It's all about the Arabian Nights, the stories of Aladdin, 
and it was coincidental that at the very time we were building this, they were in production on the film Aladdin, and it really made us think a lot about that. And the more we looked into uh, the European perspective on stories and fables and whatnot, we found things like Babar the Elephant, the Sinbad stories, the 101 Nights. These were all really part of this culture because they were sort of foreign. So reading stories like Cendrillon and uh, you know uh, Sleeping Beauty and so forth, that's your local thing. That would be like us reading The Wizard of Oz. But like when you think of exotic, there aren't exotic fairy tales about America, but there are a lot of fairy tales about the uh, Middle East and so forth. So the front entrance is designed a lot around creating a place where a giant rock bird's egg could nest on the roof over there and where you could walk through a hallway and meet genies and Aladdin and so on. But directly ahead of you is the Swiss Family Treehouse, which is the kind of icon for an <coughs> island devoted to pirates. And uh, when we did this park, we debated about doing Tom Sawyer's Island, which is a kid's play area in California and Florida, or coming up with something new that was a little bit more international. And we tested it, and everybody was more excited about going to a pirate island and finding buried treasure and all of the things that that would give you. So we shifted. We chose not to build Tom Sawyer Island, and we created Adventure Island. And then we put all of our pirate-related stories very close together there. So we have Pirates of the Caribbean, which is our flagship. Uh, and the work that's going on in there, you will not believe how great that's going to look with some new brand new things in there that are going to be, how did they do that? Um, and then we got the Ben Gunn's Cave and the Skull Rock and the Pirate Ship. Uh, and then we took advantage of the fact, since we were building this all at once, it's not like Disneyland and Florida where little by little they added things. We were building this all on opening day, so we moved uh, Peter Pan's flight very close to all these pirate activities. So we got that advantage of the Captain Hook and the whole, you know, what, uh, Never Neverland is very, very close to uh, all of our pirate activities. Now the surprise for all of us is, and a lot of times we do an attraction based on a movie, but we never dreamed that we were going to have a huge series of hit films based on a ride. And so, as Pirates of the Caribbean became more known around the world as a movie than a ride, we've been able to take advantage of that. And I think you'll see in the new version, a lot of uh, you know, new things in there that really bring both the movie and the ride closer together. And we have the space available there to do amazing things with uh, uh, Adventure Isle becoming a place for the pirates. And finally, last but not least, is Frontierland. Um, in America, we take it for granted. You know, it's just this place, the American place that we go to. But when you look here, and we to many, many little bookstores, not the ones in Paris, but out in the villages, to see what people think about in terms of America, and everything that came to the top was kind of, I call it that, John Ford, John Wayne West, the, the movies depicted back in the early color days of film. Um, the monuments and the stone and these rugged men on horses. And when I arrived here, the number one billboard all over Paris was a Marvel man. So uh, the cowboy was alive and well. And when I turned on the television, Zorro, Disney's films, uh, television shows from the 50s, those Zorro episodes were still running. And they are today. I was told by a group yesterday, Zorro is still on television here. So the whole idea of the kind of mythic American West is really, really exciting for people that live so far away from it that getting a, a real taste of it here at Frontierland was something that was uh, run, ran at the top of the charts in terms of the interest level to see this. Now, we've always added Big Thunder as the very last thing late in the game to Disneyland in California and to Florida. The land was already built, so you go, where can we put it? Oh, way over in that corner in Walt Disney World and way over in that corner in Disneyland. But because, again, we were building everything on opening day, where should the Thunder be? It's the best ride we have in this whole uh, land. So let's put it smack dab in the middle. Well, that's fine, but how do you get out there if uh, the river is running all around it? And I had an ulterior motive. I knew that one of our weakest parts on the ride in California is the ending. 
because we have to save a little bit of the energy to get you out of the station and back down into the beginning of the ride. So unlike the second, the first and the second thrill portion, they go all the way to the bottom. Uh, on that final one, you have to stay a little bit above the bottom so that when we launch the next car, it has somewhere to go before it picks up. But by putting it out on the island, we can dive all the way down under the river both going out and then at the end we add to that this terrific thrill getting from a very high point all the way down where we hit the fastest speed I think of any Disney coaster anywhere around the world. I might be wrong on that but I believe it is and it's pitch black and it's turned Big Thunder and Over Here and Rest into the favorite ride in this park. Definitely my favorite Big Thunder anywhere in the world and uh, something we're really proud of now because we've added a new finale to it and freshened it up and I think it looks better than it did even on opening day. So uh, that's the centerpiece. What's great about its location is it's not just fun to ride but it's really fun to look at. Now I've talked a lot about all the lands, maybe more than I should have, but I'll give you a, a, a chance here to pick one of these four and we'll go in there and talk a little bit in more detail based on what the interest level is. So let's start. How many would like to go to Discovery Land and raise your hands? I do not see one hand. How many would like to go to Fantasy Land? I do not see one hand. So we're going to leave the park right now. How many would like to go to Adventure Land? One, two, three. That means everybody wants to go to Frontierland. Yeah. So I was right when I told you Europeans really love that part of the world, right? Okay, so let's go. Struggle between opening up the West to Western thinking versus the Native American who loves and dearly cherishes the beauty of the past. And we thought maybe there's a way we could demonstrate that with this encampment. And it's not an unfriendly Indian village like uh, was often the topic back in the early Western days where they were all, you know, fighting with bows and arrows. And, you know, there were a lot of uh, Native Americans that were very peaceful people and they traded with the uh, settlers and so forth. So what you see here is kind of that moment in time where you have the Native Americans that had the, the nature. And I think the song in Pocahontas that I love that sort of describes this is Colors of the Wind, where you see John Smith's desire to exploit the land and develop it versus Pocahontas' desire to really love and appreciate the, the wonders of the land. Now we knew going in that Europeans might not have as much knowledge about the type of people that live in a space like this. So if you're interested, you can go into great detail in this park. Like I said, every land has details upon details that I think are richer than we were able to do uh, before. So if you step into the fort here, you'll go up and you'll see a lot of characters uh, that are part of the Western story, all the way up to like Buffalo Bill and Davy Crockett and his sidekick Russell. And uh, you can kind of strengthen your feelings for what it might have been like to live in such a rustic environment. And, and this was only like 150 years ago that the world was like this. It's hard to believe. Because if you're in LA sitting in a traffic jam, you can't imagine that you know, that isn't that long, 150 years ago, uh, that, that things were so incredibly different with none of the technological things we have today. Um, as I said, we built all of this at once. In Disneyland, there's actually two forts. I think there is in Florida, too. And neither one of them is, is completely an attraction into its own. So here we said, let's just build one fort and make it way bigger and have it an attraction within it that, that gives you some storytelling to set up the thing. And one of the best views of the island out there, Big Thunder, is where that man is taking a picture right now. So if you if you want to get a good, unique view, come here at 9 in the morning when we open and get that shot. It's really spectacular when the sun uh, hits the mountain in the right way. So walking through the fort, it sort of becomes a gateway, a gateway to the west. And when you step out, we were very careful in each land to have a symbol beyond that. So I think Big Thunder is the most, well, you'd have to debate on it. Is Big Thunder or Space Mountain the most dramatic uh, reveal to step into the land? Uh, probably, no, I'll let you decide that. I'm looking now that Big Thunder is nice. I can see all the new safety lights. 
those lights are not going to be there because back in 1880 they did not have uh, lights like that. But we hear a lot about the safety of our guests, so those immediately come on whenever uh, we need to get people safely out of the Yeah. And they're not any real river in particular, they're just indicative of uh, the look of very many different rivers that might flow through the, the western area, the Colorado and the Pecos River and so forth. Uh, I, I don't like that you're getting a picture of the lights on right now. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> what just happened uh, about in the last year is a major, major reconstruct on this to bring it back and actually improve it from when we opened. So it's actually better than when it opened. Technologies are so refined now. We went in and did a lot of technological things, just like even the capture of your photo, which used to be a big cumbersome thing. They were able to get rid of all this ugly equipment that was in there and, and make it really look nice over there when uh, the water splashes come up. All the trees were replaced, so they're in scale with a mountain like that. Part of the illusion comes across because we scale down all the trees. If we put in full-size trees, we realize that the mountain is just a little over 100, 100 feet tall, when we want you to think it's 1,000 feet tall, or 300 meters or so, you know? So we do that by, by changing the plant materials and everything else we can to um, affect that distance. Um, what, like I said, this, I mean, we talked a little bit about this being the centerpiece. And what we really wanted to do is something that Walt Disney had told us, taught us all, uh, that he wanted all the lands to be alive with lots of movement going on. So by putting the most uh, kinetic piece in the center, no matter where you go, except when it's not running, you have all this activity and excitement. Um, and so if you start over there where the Molly Brown is coming in and the Haunted Mansion, they see the splashdown effect that we have over there on the Big Thunder coming through the middle here, all the way over the low area. It's totally captivating. Now our other frontier lands really show a panorama of very different parts of the American West. But a lot of our West looks a lot like Europe. And we thought, let's not do all those parts that just reflect beautiful green forests and whatnot. Let's try to keep an entire frontier land dry. Now that may, may sound easy, but here where it rains every day, the ground wants to be green and swans want to swim in this water and everything. So trying to keep it look like an authentic American Western desert is very, very difficult. So for our cactus and succulent plants that come out just about now, maybe in another month, they have to be kept in a greenhouse all winter long to keep them from being frosted by the, the cold in the winter. And they bring those out and that adds to the uh, atmosphere of the place. And other things that were changed is like, if you were to look at the Haunted Mansion, which is just about in the same place at Disneyland, we have New Orleans Square, which is a part of the West. It's, it was the West when America was moving, but it's not the West that is comes to mind when you think of the cowboy and the, and the Native American. So we took out, we didn't do New Orleans Square, we created something that continues this effect of being in the far, far West. The Haunted Mansion in Disneyland is done in a very colonial and, and beautiful, elegant style. And Walt Disney did say, he said, we'll take care of the outside, we'll make it beautiful, and then the ghosts can take care of the inside. But we thought about that and we said, because we know there will be five languages spoken commonly in this park, why not do something that says haunted from the first get-go, you know, look at it, you go, now where is that, that Phantom Manor, where is it? Oh, there it is, because you can recognize that. It isn't a beautiful building, it's a very frightening, scary building. And uh, even the name, if we had used Haunted Mansion, which we use in the United States, it would have been something, pardon my French, but Maison du Haunt, something like that. And uh, that would not be readable in some of the other languages. So Phantom Manor is very close in all of the languages, so we went with that. And so being visual was a really key, important part of this park. And I think that's why the, the lands are so distinctive from each other. They really are, more so than I think what, we, what you would see where 
an American audience could really be comfortable with all the subtleties of Kentucky and New Orleans and St. Louis and all the variants that we have all mixed together there. But when we wanted to tell a story here for people where this isn't in their neighborhood, let's make it very, very clear. And I think because of that, it's more powerful. It really is. So going this way, you know, we have the, the load area for Big Thunder Mountain. And uh, part of the fun there is the people that come by at the end of the ride have just gone through the fastest part of the experience. And so I love watching their faces when they come up out of that hole over there. Uh, and there's a great place you can stand along the fence and get some really good views of people kind of being shocked by the light because they've been in this black hole down under the water uh, speeding along at a real clip and then all of a sudden popped it back up into the station. It's kind of fun. How did we get out there? How did we get back? When I remember we proposed it, they said, how high are you going to have to build the track to get over to the smokestacks to get out there? And I said, we're not going over the smokestacks. We're going to go under the water. Oh, okay. So anyway, in the end, we have the only Big Thunder where Tom Sawyer Island is in all our other parks. And we didn't get rid of the activities of Tom Sawyer Island. We have those activities and many more over on Adventure Island with a new theme and something that I think everybody around the world can truly enjoy. So um, we could, I have a few more minutes if you want to walk towards. You have uh, like uh, 11 minutes. Okay, so which way would you like to walk? Over to the Haunted Mansion or over that way? That way, okay. Somebody is assertive, that's what, that's what we're gonna do don't have the narration, which was something that we rely on heavily in California. We did record the famous actor Vincent Price in one of his last performances doing that. I believe you can still hear him laughing at the end of the stretching room. Uh, I would like someday to think about bringing that back. He speaks with an American accent in French, and a lot of people were felt that, that we shouldn't use that, but I thought later, why did I let myself be talked out of that? Because <laughs> if it was an American gold baron, he would have an American accent. We, we love seeing films with French because it makes it romantic, because that language is very romantic, so hearing the accent is good for us in America, and, and so I think having an American accent would have a similar feeling for the French, but maybe I'm wrong. I was told I was wrong. But I think that would be really good. So that ride is very different. I think it was technically ahead of its time. And what's really exciting is now that the technologies are coming into being, that are going to allow us to really fulfill some of the dreams we had for that. I think, you know, far in the future, we're going to see some changes in there that will, will be to your liking to make it more, bring those effects really to life. Okay, so we're moving now into the southwest, keeping the same dry look. And believe me, I was with Luke. Uh, yeah, fine. Okay. What you're looking at, you know, I, I told you Disneyland is not a museum, but it is a museum. Because here in Frontierland, you're immersed right now in authentic mining equipment that was garnered from all over the southwest, from Colorado. Mexico, and there was one of our Imagineers named Pat Byrne. Pat would have done this on his own. He didn't have the money to do it, so he would just go and photograph and bring back pictures. And we said, Pat, how would you like to actually go out there and find all these things, and then you can buy them, you know? And so he was a very, very humble and quiet person, very, very nice, and he would kind of Look at down there. You would crush the rock and then would be mine. And once it was crushed, then it could separate the gold out of it. That's a real piece. That's a real steam engine that was used to haul the ore out of the mines. So everything you're looking at was actually used about 150 years ago for this equipment. But that cow would stand there and say, Well, oh, I really like it. And the person might say, I can see that you really care for this and I'm getting older and I'm not going to be able to make sure it's, it's well loved and everything. So I'll give it to you for a, a nice...
and then he'd get out the check and then he'd walk to see, you know, and, and they were probably sitting there saying, wow, we could have probably gotten a lot more money. So what was the result of that? Pat had a fixed budget, and we thought he'd only be able to get a few things for that amount of money. And everything you see here is due to Pat being able to spend that budget in the best way possible. I think this is the best museum of Western artifacts anywhere in the world. But instead of them being in a room or a plaque that describes what it was and how it was used, they're out here and you're seeing them because Pat knew how they were used. He put all these scenes together, so everything you see is exactly how the Myers would have had it in operation. So they're not out of context in the huts. They're actually here, uh, integrated with the attraction to, to continue that theme that this is a real chance to get on a wild mining ride for the woods. Okay. So now we're down to probably about five minutes. So how about some Q and A before we have to break up a little bit? Yes. It's like a 35 years of operational experience and reaction. Yeah. If you have to reveal the fact today regarding the design, we do something differently. I'd say it more like this. We're 25 years into the future and there's new things. There were no cell phones really. There was no there were PCs but not it wasn't a part of your life. There were so many things that are different now that you probably would just do differently I look at it and I go, all right, we have Snow White and we have Pinocchio, but the movies, this movie, the movies, the Lion King and Tangled, which I love that movie, uh, wouldn't a Tangled ride be really good? Or, you know, of course, now we have, you know, uh, it's Frozen, all the other opportunities. None of those existed. So you'd say, to make Fantasyland more right there with kids today. Of course we picked those, but at the time we built this, the films that we had were the ones that we chose. So time, time is a factor in that. It's not like, would I necessarily do it differently? Because when I think about this park, it's the most beautiful park. Just walking through it, even if you don't go on rides, you're having a wonderful time looking at it. And so the rides are the part that it does need to change as time goes on. So you'll find every Disney park. We have disappointed fans when we take when we took out Adventure to Inner Space, which I grew up with in California. I could still do the entire spiel for centuries. Man had but its own two eyes to explore the universe. That was my childhood, and now it's going away. But Star Tours is a better show, and more people are interested in it. So Part of the challenge we have is looking at the park and saying, what is still really relevant? Something like Pirates. You can keep putting new things into Pirates because everybody loves that theme and that story. Um, and then you have to look for the opportunities where, what are the little girls, what, what princesses do they like now? And those characters really need to be there. But nobody's ever going to take my dragon out the better <laughs> Okay, yes. Um, maybe you can talk about the shooting gallery here. If you yeah. slide, there's the story of the land somewhere. Oh, to all, all, Let me, inside the shooting gallery. We can go there if you want, but yeah, no, no, it's, no. it's right behind Yeah, there, I know where it is, but I can't remember what we did in there. Oh, there's the boot hill. Yeah, yeah boot those, hill. Those yeah. Lanes, so. I really, I, 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 you, you hit on something that I haven't checked out since I've been back here. <laughs> okay. And uh, I don't remember it. And generally what we do once we've got the solid idea for the area, one of our designers is given that task, somebody that we trust, and you say, that's your piece, and you now come and make it the very best you can. And, you know, the, each one of us has something that we contribute to. And so, uh, I probably trusted him. He was into the, at that time, whatever the target systems were. Now you can do it with lasers and whatnot, but at the time, well, it was an electronic eye thing and whatnot, so I couldn't really speak about that. Which part of the park holds the, the memories for you where maybe this is a place you want to come back to again and again still this many years later? Well, I have that feeling for every area here. Um, let's just go through. I, I love Big Thunder and to get to do it four times and put it on four, three continents, that's pretty... How many mountains are on three continents, you know, so that's... Hey, it's running. I hear it. Okay. So that's probably Frontierland. The castle, 
because it was such a challenge. And the fact that I got my dragon, you know, so that's pretty cool. And then probably Discovery Mountain, you know, in the submarine, the Nautilus, that, that complex over there. I could go over there on that again and again, both of those. And they're such a compliment because the one is aggressive and uh, scary, and the other one, you can just get absorbed and lost in the in the fantasy of what Jules Verne and Harper Goff, from, who's the designer of that boat, uh, were able to do. So those are my three. And the hotel. I love the hotel because it was such a challenge. And I, I love the fact that it's now become a product for Disney. So we have the Miracosta and the Disneyland Hotel in Tokyo, and we have the, the Grand Californian in California. And we wouldn't have those if this hadn't proved to be uh, something that was a wise decision. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm with a group right now, so... Uh, we're finishing in two minutes, yeah. and then we'll do yeah. some pictures. Okay, yeah, okay. So, um, does anyone have... Yes. You said you went back into Pirates here when you were working. Yeah. Just was, that, was that the same feel when you went into Pirates when you built it back in Disney when you started um, here? I didn't think about that. No, because I remember this Pirates from the 20th anniversary when I was here of being beautiful and finished. Okay. So I went into it this week and it's like construction. There's nothing there. I mean, the figures are gone, the sets are all being repainted, the trees are all being replaced and all this stuff. So it was weird. It was, I, I had I thought they were going to go in, you know, the feather duster in um, Beauty and the Beast. You know, I thought they were going to polish here and there. No, it's like start over. It's like they are literally rebuilding that ride and adding new things. And so it, it was it was unique. Whereas when I saw that pirate ride, he was talking about I got to ride on the pirate ride. It was the day that Walt Disney died and the ride wasn't ready, uh, but I'd never seen a pirate ride. There were no figures in it. It was dead quiet. There were no songs being played. They were just moving the boats through. And I was out there at the park because I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. My, my hero had just died that day. And I was just a young kid and I, I said, I looked in the window and the boats were going and I walked over to the employee thing and the, the man said, I said, well, could I ride on it? And he says, yeah, sure, get in. And to ride through that ride for your first time in your life when nobody's seen a pirate ride anywhere in the world, and all the time you're going, oh, Walt Disney just died today. That was just, that was, you know, a shock. So, you know, this was very different. This was remembering it being finished and beautifully lit and all that. And now it's all work lights and scaffolding and all the work going on to put in the new things. And uh, so, is strange, but I what excited me about is how much work is going on. I know it's going to surprise everybody about how brave it is. Is there a date? Yeah. Yeah. July. 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 Okay, July. And now I know why it's taking so much time because they're doing so much work. It's going to be beautiful. We're going to we need to stop now the tour. All right. If you want, just now to. Do a few sightings of our pictures. It's the moment we have a uh, six, seven minutes for that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Maybe.